Good evening. Welcome to the Kinoshita Lecture by well-renowned Prisca Prize-winning Japanese architect, Professor Fumihiko Maki. My name is Diane Lam, a year two Master of Architecture student from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Today, we are greatly honored to have invited Professor Maki to deliver his lecture at our university campus. First of all, may I invite Professor Nelson Chen, Director of the School of Architecture, to introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you. Distinguished guests, faculty colleagues, students, alumni, and friends of the School of Architecture. A very warm welcome to you this evening on this special occasion of the 2018 Kinasha Lecture in Architecture. On behalf of the Chinese University of Hong Kong and our School of Architecture, we are very grateful and privileged for this opportunity to hear in a few moments from Fumihiko Maki, the internationally renowned award-winning architect from Tokyo, whose globally acclaimed design works are well known by many of us in this audience, judging by the size of the audience, which is going to be standing room only. Before introducing our distinguished speaker, I would like to acknowledge the long-standing generosity of Mr. James Kinoshida to support this annual lecture that bears his name with the aim of inviting the most distinguished architects from overseas to come here and share their insights and experience with our students as well as the architectural community in Hong Kong. Jim and his wife Lana are unavailable to join us this evening, but they are represented by their son Andrew. Uh, please convey our best wishes to your parents on behalf of all of us. Uh, and now, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce our guest speaker, Fumihiko Maki, who has practiced professionally for over five decades and is still going strong. He has been honored by the highest accolades of the architectural profession worldwide, including, in the US, the AIA Gold Medal, Thomas Jefferson Prize, Arnold Brunner Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Wolf Prize from Israel, the Premium Imperial from the Japan Arts Association, and honorary fellowships in the professional architectural institutes from a dozen countries including Australia, France, Germany, the UK, that's the RIBA, US, AIA, among others. Most notably, Fumihiko Maki was an early recipient of the Pritzker Prize, the Nobel Prize of our profession and a Lifetime Achievement Award. But as he won this prize in 1993, 25 years ago, uh, his was essentially a mid-career prize. Uh, considering the magnitude of his work from then until now, uh, it's too bad he's not allowed to win it twice. He was educated at University of Tokyo, then Cranbrook Academy of Art and Harvard Graduate School of Design. After receiving a Graham Foundation Fellowship, he was an associate professor at both Washington University in St. Louis and Harvard GSD, before eventually becoming a long-standing professor of architecture at the University of Tokyo. As a young academic, Professor Maki authored a highly influential treatise titled Investigations in Collective Form, first published in 1964. It was required reading for architectural students of my generation in the 70s. Uh, come to think of it, I, I, I think uh, it should be required reading for all our architecture students at CUHK today. Perhaps in reaction to the prevailing interest in those years of the megastructure, such as the Tokyo Project and others, this critical study by Professor Maki focused instead on the city as formed by open spaces rather than building masses, respecting the specific character of an urban site, the knitting together of buildings, urban spaces, streets, and footpaths. As he described it, collective form represented groups of buildings, not single structures unrelated to each other, but buildings that have reason to be together, especially over time, and the city as a pattern of events. 
at Hillside Terrace, this vision was realized as a kind of urban design lab that the practice of Mackey and Associates designed and realized incrementally over 23 years in six stages. Its lesson and legacy are for us to remember that while architecture may ultimately be art, it is always a social art and service of society. Our ultimate goal should not be designing iconic buildings as objects, but creating iconic places for people and their activities. Fast forward five decades, and I would like to highlight a recently completed project by Professor Maki called Four World Trade Center, one of four towers surrounding the Ground Zero Redevelopment Site in New York City. The other buildings are Tower One, the so-called Freedom Tower by SOM, over 100 stories tall. Tower Two, originally designed by Norman Foster, now by BIG, Bjarke Ingalls. Tower Three, designed by Richard Rogers. And Tower Four, by Professor Maki, the smallest but still a significant high rise over 70 stories, all in accordance with the master plan originally 15 years ago by Daniel Liebeskin. So towers one, three, and four are now completed. When the master layout plan and models were first published, I remember feeling puzzled, even uh, somewhat worried by the Maki scheme. And the block model it was the least figurative the least dramatic. Was the minimalism taken too far? It appeared to me like a mismatch between a lightweight boxer versus heavyweights, and three of them in the, in the ring. But the built reality of 4WTC turns out to be both a visual marvel and an urban lesson, with its angled geometries informed by urban sight lines, its structure appearing not as building volumes, but as dematerialized, reflective, planar surfaces. In certain lighting conditions, the 70-story high-rise building virtually merges with the sky, then re-emerges from another viewpoint. Thus, Fort WTC does not try to outmuscle its neighboring towers with boxing. It's exercising Tai Chi, deflecting and gently pushing back the more aggressive formal moves of the others and channeling the energy of its site context. In this ring, it's a clear winner by a knockout, a masterpiece of minimalism and a masterclass of urbanism with commitment to collective form. Now there's an intriguing observation from Lewis Sullivan that architectural works resemble their architects and personalities. Uh, so let's consider some examples say, Richard Rogers, with his outgoing personality and brightly colored shirts, compared with his buildings of exposed structure and service stocks typically in bright primary colors. That works. Or Tadeo Ando, a former boxer in his youth, with his raw concrete boxes and hard-edged geometries. Or the late Zaha Hadid, extroverted and outspoken personality wearing flowing capes and collars. Now think about the expressive free-flowing forms of her parametric designs. When considering the designs of Fumihiko Maki, they are also very much like the architect himself, reflecting a refined balance of simplicity, elegance, integrity, honest expression, gracious personality. His buildings are always thoughtfully considered, crisply geometrical, understated, yet bespeaking of lasting quality. As an architecture that is quiet, but persuasive, no need to shout its important message. His work is imbued with unified clarity, yet respects the complexity and variety of modern life with remarkable sensitivity and spirit, from overall form to final detail at every step with exceptional care and craft. His architecture is not of the moment or trends or styles, but about timeless, enduring values, what I would identify as having less concern for what's first and instead 
a profound commitment to what lasts. Thus, fittingly, the, tonight, the title of tonight's lecture is Towards a Humane Architecture. It is truly with great personal pleasure and professional admiration that I introduce to you Professor Fumihiko Maki. Thank you very much for uh, introduction by Professor Chen. I'm also very honored to be back to uh, Chinese University here to give a talk on Kinoshita lectures. So uh, I must uh, just start with who I was, because uh, here uh, quite many young people do not know the time I was brought up. The one on the left, my mentor in the University of Tokyo, whom I studied but also taught together later. Then my mentor in uh, GSA Harvard was uh, Jose Rizot. Jose Rizot is uh, Spanish and came to uh, GSD when I became a student, 1953. But also, I talked with him later. I had a chance to uh, associate with the uh, metabolist people. Uh, we uh, produced the uh, our manifesto in 1960 when we had a world first uh, international conference in Tokyo. Myself, Kikutake, Kurokawa, and Otoko. But also, on that particular year, I was invited by uh, Peter Smithson to uh, attend uh, one of uh, Siam meetings in Bagnol Suces in South France. And uh, I was able to meet uh, Bakema Van Eyck from uh, Netherlands, Giancarlo Picaro from Italy, then uh, Candelis from Paris and so on. So, uh, thought often invited those people to GSD, where I also met many of them several times. But the people all respected Blue Corbusier at that time, without any question. But he also influenced architect by wearing bow tie. I was wearing a bow tie when I was giving a presentation on my first project as an architect in Washington, New York. And I was amazed when I visited the Harvard later. The archive had a collection of bow ties worn by Walter Gropius, Marcel Breuer, and I'm sure Le Corbusier. But I have written the uh, short essay called Modernism on the Open Sea. And my uh, understanding was that until end of 1970, we all architects on the same boat called modernism, heading maybe unknown places. But with the Corbusier, Miss van der Rohe, Arthur Arto, and the, uh, uh, all those 
uh, Franco write as guest of owners in the same book. But then, Modernism became a one big information center. And together with that, this boat disappeared. And we were thrown into an open sea with no manifesto or team meetings, etc. But still, each architect must find his way to a wave to go and uh, I think, I'm not going into a lecture on uh, modernism, but my contention is that, fortunately, sea is not flat. They have uh, some waves. And uh, with my contention is that kind of a humanism with uh, empathy might be uh, one on which we can make our own swimming. Then I like to show some of our projects I have done in the recent past, both in Japan and abroad. The one I am showing is Kazenoka Crematorium. I did in 1997 in a small city in southern Japan. And uh, here you see uh, crematorium, but the mayor asked us to do it in a big park because crematorium is not the welcome facilities in Japan quite often. So uh, we try to merge the building as a piece of a sculpture into a large the, uh, park. We have uh, also the uh, existing symmetry and the remain of the, uh, some old ancient kinds of things. So uh, it consists as like a necropolis. And uh, you, we made the uh, uh, our ground to raise, to cut off the height of uh, elements in the crematorium. So, People in here may not be too much aware where they are in front of crematorium. Sketches. And you come into an uh, entrance. Then through here, you go into a uh, next space where you have a uh, fast goodbye to a uh, disease. Then you come into a crematorium proper where you give a final farewell. And after that, you wait for hour or so until the uh, body was cremated. And I think this is uh, the uh, way we make our crematorium. And uh, uh, after I made this one, this project, I visited the, uh, the city. And many people said, thank you, Mr. Maki. Now we can die in peace. Uh, <laughs> this is the highest compliment I ever received as an architect. Just like uh, running the uh, uh, restaurant, the people come for the last supper. But anyway, uh, it might have hit kind of an unconscious wish that people or society have. I think this is, seems to be a very important experience. Yes, you see, uh, you go into the uh, enshrined room where uh, friends, relatives come and share the uh, ashes and the bones and into a small white uh, ceramic bowl and go home. That was the whole process 
of the year. Now I come into a hillside of terrace, which I did very slowly over the 25 years in six phases. Fortunately, it has a wide street, but also a very low density the, uh, situation with only 10 meters high uh, to allow and 150% the uh, uh, FAR. So we are able to produce kind of uh, sequences of small open spaces, corner plaza, sunken garden, and then uh, uh, second phase, central plaza, and uh, etc. And so uh, uh, those things uh, could have a kind of a public exposures, but with a humane sort of uh, environment. And you could see a number of uh, small spaces with still many greens left. And I think uh, it gives uh, us a lesson. You like to have a good public access, but not so high density situations, low density, sometimes able to make. We are very lucky to have this kind of things. Uh, otherwise, we have not been able to make uh, sequences of spaces. You see, uh, corner uh, central plaza, and uh, also existing small uh, shrine, and the building uh, was made by surrounding it. And also, a number of the trees are quite effective in uh, making a humane environment. So you could see from this the, uh, diagram that uh, we try to make many public spaces in uh, red color, to, like uh, uh, corner galleries, sunken auditorium, and big uh, galleries with the uh, uh, cafe and so on to give an uh, intimate. Uh, this is an interesting uh, uh, chart. The uh, uh, UCLA people uh, listed about 150 modernism architecture in uh, 20 centuries and ask some architects which building should be seen by young people, students. They are not asking which one is the most beautiful building or newest building. Instead, the building, by looking at, you might be able to learn something. And the best score was given to uh, Miss van der Rohe, Barcelona Pavilion. But then, Hillside Terrace came together with several local bridges buildings. And I felt very honored <laughs> to be on the, uh, the, this uh, upper part of uh, this. Anyway, then I would like to show to uh, some of the latest uh, university project we have done at the center of the city. And the first phase was completed, 2012, uh, three of them. Then uh, last year we completed. Four. The most uniqueness of this campus was that it's in a highly dense situation in uh, Tokyo with uh, where we used the uh, public uh, rail stations where about a million people pass every day. And the uh, ward office requested that people should be able to move freely in the university. So there is no gate, uh, no uh, wall 
and uh, uh, certain places only university people can go will be through this uh, card. And uh, now you could see there is a public street dividing the uh, campus into two. But with these uh, bridges, everybody can go up or go into. And just behind, they outsource the, uh, some popular Italian restaurants. And in the front, we made a loge. Loge is a well-known city room in uh, many cities in Italy, like uh, Bologna. You have many of them. And similarly, we are able to have this loge for people who are not students, but just live and chatting sometime. And sometimes students can give a, a music of improvisation and so on. So uh, it was uh, very well used. And behind is a restaurant and also galleries open to the uh, public. And now, across the street, there is a main plaza uh, with the uh, uh, student cafe uh, in the front, but also the people in uh, uh, this area in, yeah, yeah, uh, use uh, this place. But one of the most uh, important things is that some kindergarten teachers bring the uh, children here because the uh, campus may not be too big, and they love to come for uh, such a big place. So this is the, probably one of the first times university campus could be used by uh, children. And uh, you could see some children hugging the uh, round columns. They may remember when they hug mothers you know, they're young, or hug. So uh, I recommend when you young architects here you design the kindergarten, please use round columns, not <laughs> square columns. We learn quite bad out of what we have done. It's a kind of a pleasure of uh, our practice. And evening, when there is some gathering, the frontal wall become uh, this kind of uh, things, and uh, people gather us. And sometimes uh, we have uh, small uh, festivities, and uh, Mikoshi could go through the uh, campus. So it's completely uh, integrated with the uh, daily life of neighborhood. Now I go into uh, MIT campus, as you know, uh, we created this one in 2009. And our client, Nicolas Negroponte, asked us, please make the building like a big house. And we interpreted big house as a kind of a place when one can find own place in relation to the rest. In the house, when you are living room, you expect the kitchen will be the next, and also the uh, uh, bedroom will be uh, somewhere next. So this kind of uh, awareness would come out of the, this basic principle. And uh, we thought, we have been asked to make uh, seven laboratories uh, with a big open sort of a uh, space and with a mezzanine for uh, the uh, senior persons. And we had uh, seven of them, and uh, they are staggered uh, together like this way. And uh, also we made the uh, partitions all transparent so people have the uh, kind of a 
view through horizontally, and we have a big open space, so vertically or even diagonally. And by doing it this way, we are able to produce uh, this kind of a building. And uh, this uh, building, a few years ago, received a Halston Prize. It's one of the best, uh, most beautiful buildings in uh, Cambridge, uh, Boston area. And uh, uh, it's a detail. And uh, in uh, Boston areas, you are not allowed to have uh, open, clear, glass facade anymore. But we, by uh, providing aluminum screen, we are able to do that, uh, to cut off uh, unnecessary sort of uh, uh, heat in the daytime. And uh, so evening, it becomes uh, quite transparent. And it's uh, connected to uh, existing Media Lab, designed by IMP. And uh, we have this kind of uh, openness. And uh, you can see how these seven the, uh, studios are uh, interconnected. It's a detail. Uh, in this way, at the central plaza on the fourth, uh, third floor, uh, people can gather for lunch on uh, Friday. And sometimes this place becomes uh, for a disco in the evening. It's a year of studios. And just below the top floor, we have a small cafe for uh, people. And when you go up, there will be a small open space looking at silhouette of the uh, Boston. Then, 2007, we did Republic Polytechnic in Singapore, uh, near the uh, Malaysian Strait. The place used to be a, a British a prison camp, still snakes there. But uh, Polytechnic uh, able to have half of them and have uh, this kind of uh, the, uh, appearance. And you could say the organization is based on collective form we created, we suggested in uh, 1964. Professor Chen just mentioned this uh, collective form. And there are a number of uh, similar uh, studios, uh, like a group form, but with a huge sort of a plateau underneath to create kind of a mega form, then compositional sort of a placement on uh, uh, administration, cultures, and uh, uh, garage, etc. Uh, this is a gymnasium and the housing for you could say the uh, system of you know, learning is different from ordinary. The uh, classroom versus teaching student. So instead, the uh, solving the certain learning problem. This system originated in England, was brought in here, where students are given the problem by tutors in the morning and later afternoon. Uh, they must come back in individual or group to report their finding. So uh, this 
yellow space we call Agora becomes a very important for our students' gathering. And there are uh, many uh, places like cafe or the uh, uh, library and so on. But we use same principle of open transparent system. It's uh, like a boulevard and uh, with a small opening to uh, avoid direct sun coming into a place because it's a tropical place. And the uh, wireless sort of a library where people are able to discuss the problems and so on. And also, as you know, Singapore, Mopolian is made of 70% Chinese, 20% Malaysian, 10% Indian. So uh, Malaysian students sometimes give a singing. Chinese students give a this kind of a, a festival, festive object. But and we made also a snake type, the uh, bench where students can just gather and chat. But one of the most important things is that the center, they created small cafe and also billiard board. And uh, this uh, seems to be the uh, only campus where the central part has a billiard board. But altogether, people are also able to sit just by themselves to avoiding the uh, group thing. And uh, then I go into uh, Aga Khan Museum, which was made 2014. Uh, and uh, Charles Korea did the Ismaili Center. We've been asked to uh, make very light sensitive building. I received uh, His Highness Aga Khan five pages of letters when I started this uh, project. And he asked the Islam architecture is a very sensitive to uh, natural light. So we decided to find out whitest granite in the world. It took a uh, year and a half. And uh, finally, we found it in Brazil. It's called Margarita. So when uh, I have a pizza, always I remember this stone. And uh, you could see. And I tried to make two-story high building, slightly slanted to also give a different the, uh, uh, reflection of light is a natural way to uh, express two-story building. And one thing important in the museum is that like we do not have too many openings on the exterior. So the uh, central plaza becomes very important. When you look at Greek old cities, uh, houses, they are nestled together. So they all have the, uh, the central plaza to which their activities will be oriented. And sometimes the funeral takes place in these places as well. And so we had a similar idea with the central court and foyer for the hall and entrance for museum proper, restaurant, information center, children's school, etc. And people are able to come here freely and uh, only pay a gate at entrances of uh, galleries and why uh, when some events are taking place. 
but uh, His Highness uh, always advocates pluralism. And he said he can make the building very modern when they look at from outside. But please make uh, Islam ambiance when you go into inside. So uh, we use the, uh, some Islam patterns on floors and so on. But also, people are able to come and it becomes kind of a small community centers. And when nothing is going on on the court, then people can come out and chat. It's a very friendly sort of a space. Sometimes wedding also takes place in here as well. Galleries. It's all Islamic art. And uh, Chinese uh, love eight as a lucky number, and Islam loves seven as a lucky number. So uh, we try to use uh, seven sort of a uh, uh, This is the uh, Singapore Media Corp. We completed uh, three years ago. Uh, this was a site. And the uh, master plan was done by Zaha Hadid. That's the reason why they are not straight, sort of a Cartesian city. And our site also surrounded by a horse street. Had we had a very low density project, we could have a, a square building, but not. It's a very demanding sort of a special situation. So we said, why don't we use Zaha's curve for our building as well? And it has the uh, fairly large auditorium, uh, main uh, studio, and sub-studio. And with the uh, 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 offices on it's a fairly complex building. And also, we use stainless steel to clad this building, to give a better reflection. And uh, uh, those curves are all Zaha's curves, you know. And uh, uh, the stainless steel facade was made by YKK, one of the biggest uh, zipper companies. And then now it's uh, very active in uh, uh, making a facade. And uh, uh, construction was done by Kojima. So it's the first time I had an uh, all Japan sort of a, a team uh, for uh, this project. So it uh, is a uh, Zaha's sort of a curve. And here, the center has an uh, open plaza on top from which you could look down the park. From the park side. And the uh, offices is an open office. People are able to come on particular space they like to use in the everyday. And uh, also, tourists are able to go through to look down in here. And I think this is a, a kind of a media complex where not only television and the radio, but also the, uh, some kind of uh, publishing is also done on uh, this building. Very dynamic sort of uh, open spaces and uh, with uh, different sort of uh, ambience. Now I come into uh, Shenzhen, Sea World Culture and Art Center. I'm sure some of you might have seen uh, uh, this building. And when we are brought into a site, I was told this is one of the nicest sites 
you could find in uh, Shenzhen for this kind of uh, facility because it directly faces to water and looking at Hong Kong. And behind, you are able to have a mountain. Then also all surrounded by uh, existing the uh, uh, Shenzhen uh, development. So uh, we decided to have this as a kind of a people's hill. And uh, uh, anybody can freely go up to the top and uh, look at, enjoy the uh, view to all other places, or can go inside to find out the places you like to go. You see this particular. And uh, we decided to have a three strong sort of protrusion to indicate one to uh, water, sea, and to then uh, park and mountain and city behind. So the landscaping we did also is well integrated with the uh, roof garden as well as you see it. And you are on the entrance and looking at the uh, building through the uh, entrance hall. So uh, the two large outdoor stairways leading you to the uh, top. And also inside some kind of uh, open public space as well. Now you see uh, this uh, kind of uh, stairways inviting for people to rest on some places or to go up to the top. This picture was taken two days after the opening. Already some musicians coming and playing and people uh, gathering here and looking at the uh, waters. And this is a very spontaneous improvisation done by people. We haven't expected this kind of scenery, but it's always pleasure when we are able to see unexpected scenery, like this uh, uh, university campus where children play. from front and it is very interesting when people come here, many of them looking at Hong Kong, not looking back the uh, Shenzhen. And maybe they have a, some kind of a special wishes, but anyway. You see the bottom we have uh, developed a kind of a greenery which could go up to the top. You see people all looking at Hong Kong side. Then you have indoor open spaces and uh, surrounded by a number of facilities. Entrance hall is a special column we made to make it a little bit iconic, symbolic. So on. And it's a central gallery run by Design Society for uh, uh, Victoria Albert Museum. And, uh, it's a 
gallery in a different wing, and our exhibition, which is going on until end of June. Now I go to India. I took these pictures, 1959, when I was making the journey to the West under a Grand Foundation Fellowship. And I was amazed by the number of the people and the massive the vegetation and also some the, uh, massive building made by uh, British colonies. So this image always stayed in today. And when we design this the uh, new museum of Bihar State on a site called Patna. Patna is the capital of uh, the uh, Bihar State. We are given 500 meter long site. And uh, so we decided to make the whole building like campus. And the program asked also children's museum uh, someplace. And then we produce central building where all people come in and go into the gallery propers. But we decided to use cotton weathering steel because this the island uh, is originally developed in uh, yeah, India and with the uh, sandstone. Uh, unfortunately, in the India, quite often the uh, maintenance of uh, public buildings are not so good. So I think combination of the cotton, weathering steel, and the sandstone could be uh, easier to maintain the building. So they are not uh, like with uh, exposed concrete. Instead, we decided to use those two materials to uh, cover the exteriors of uh, the, uh, this project. So you could see the cold and the uh, wall and stone as a base. And there is an uh, office portion at the center. But those rubbers all so crowded with these stones and so on. Now it's open and uh, there are several courts and you are able to come into the, uh, this central entrance. And this purest the uh, iron towers would not rust. Entrance court, looking at another court behind. Court surrounded by main galleries and with some bridges. And the light is always very strong. So uh, this kind of uh, opening give an interesting sort of a layer of uh, lightness. Uh, on the children's museum, by request of a uh, client, we use uh, terracotta instead of, but also it's a good material to be used in uh, India. And children's uh, museum was open two years ago. And uh, you can see the opening scene. And the amazing thing is that sometimes 3,000 students 
come to a museum in one day. It could happen only 300 in Japan. So uh, again, I uh, mentioned to you the, the massiveness of people always happen in even this museum. I was chatting with uh, somebody, some, uh, oh. Is, you see, our partner uh, is uh, below uh, Nepal, and uh, quite many uh, interesting places related to Buddhism. So uh, there are many Buddhism uh, sculpture uh, remnant uh, being found out still. Now I go into one of my last projects in New York, the WTC redevelopment. This picture was on is in the New York Times when we architects all got together to show what we have done in 205. You look you see uh, Richard Rogers and Norman Foster, uh, Daniel Lipskin, who did a master plan, uh, Governor Pataki, our client, uh, Silverstein, and myself. And our building happens to be on the fourth. First one was done by the Skidmore Owings Mill. Then Norman Foster, Richard Rogers, and ours. But two small courts are where the old World Trade Centers, two high scrapers were there. Now it became Santum Court and uh, netted with the uh, big sort of uh, trees and a very nice place for people to come. And we try to make uh, like uh, uh, glass sculptures which could give different reflection to depending on the weather, orientation, and day. Uh, this is a view from uh, Fifth Avenue side. Now it's uh, here, uh, Richard Rogers, the uh, building comes here. So uh, you could not see this kind of uh, view anymore. This is a, a very interesting uh, picture. I took 1993, right after World Trade Center was completed. I was taking an Amtrak from Philadelphia to New York, and you see there's no financial center, so the beautiful uh, ca uh, shadows cast on the Hudson River. And also, uh, I have never received so many uh, pictures from people unknown. And sometimes people said, the, uh, our building disappeared. And he sent two pictures showing one with a building and number one, and then nothing. So uh, in a way, uh, our building accidentally became homage to a people who expired here. Then our building faces to uh, to Central Park. And people come here to just a lot wonderful park and beyond. And entrance court, yeah, this view was taken when we had an opening ceremony. And from third floor, where we have uh, Italian restaurants, people are able to look down the court, like this way. Now, we go to a field. Okay.
Hi, my name is Yusuke Kashima. I'm a Japanese architect. I'll be hosting this program. Today, I'm in New York. It's September 11, a very special day. As we all know, 13 years ago, a terrible tragedy has happened. I myself remember when I used to live in the States, there was a twin tower, a very symbolic building right behind us. And now it's gone. On September 11th, 2001, terrorists launched multiple attacks against the United States, bringing down the iconic World Trade Center towers in New York and killing roughly 3,000 people. Where the Twin Towers once stood, there is now a memorial dedicated to the victims, featuring giant reflecting pools in the footprints of the towers. Around the pools are slabs of black granite with bronze plaques on which the names of all the victims are inscribed. In the 13 years since the horror of 9-11, an endless stream of visitors has brought their flowers and prayers to this site. Next to the memorial, there are newly built skyscrapers. One of the skyscrapers is designed by a Japanese architect. He's a very important Japanese architect who created the modernism and the contemporary architecture today, Fumihiko Maki. Fumihiko Maki is one of Japan's most renowned architects. He designed the new Four World Trade Center building. Two years after 9-11, redevelopment plans for the World Trade Center were announced. Four skyscrapers to be designed by world-famous architects. In November 2013, Maki's building was the first of the four to be completed. Two, three, all right. In September 2014, Maki came to New York and paid a visit to the building he designed. How do you know I am Maki? I know because I looked at the plans and I met you when the, uh, the tower opened up in November 2013. Oh. I don't know if you remember. Oh, I see. You have a good memory. Uh, a good memory. Thank you. Beautiful tower. Beautiful. Thank you. Four World Trade Center rises 977 feet, about 300 meters. It has 72 above ground and four below ground floors. Commission The dominant feature of the building is its glass facade. A special process was used to make the glass reflect light like stainless steel or aluminum, creating a mirror of the sky and nearby building. Four World Trade Center often melts away into its surroundings. Maki created a building that is unobtrusive and elegant. The lobby of the building is an airy open space with 13 meter ceilings. The floor to ceiling windows make the adjoining memorial plaza clearly visible from the lobby. And opposite the windows is a black wall that extends to the ceiling. 
ここにあのブラックグラニットの,あの壁にしましてでこれはあのミラーエフェクト鏡の役目を果たしてるで向こうのメモリアルパークが全部、まあ、映り込むという形で強い関係性をやはり作りたいっていうのが一つの考え方ですね。The water, trees, and sky. Key elements of the Memorial Plaza can also be felt inside the building. Moreover, on the back wall of each of the three elevator halls, video of flowing water, green trees, and blue sky runs on a loop. So, I'm going to be in the middle of the house. 帰ってくると今度はメモリアルパークが見えると、まあ、そういうイメージの関係を作ろうっていう。Before 9/11, Maki had visited New York countless times and seen the Twin Towers, of course. Here is a photograph he took in 1993 of the towers reflecting the sunset. September 11th, 2014. Huge crowds fill the Memorial Plaza. Standing beside the vast reflecting pools, which testify to the twin towers that once soared here, visitors contemplate the tragic events of 9 11. What do the visitors think of Maki's four World Trade Center building? I think it's great. I think they did an excellent job. You know, it was pretty, pretty tall and nice. I haven't been inside yet, but I'm hoping to.、Uh, I think also it's, it's a wonderful piece of architecture.、Um, it reflects the beauty of the city, the beauty of the souls that are unfortunately. Expired here in this area, and we love coming here. It, it brings such a warm feeling, much emotion. Maki's Tower reflects something more as well the thoughts of those who come to the memorial. Now, At the beginning, I show you the crematorium and then for WTC. And in a way, I was very pleased that two buildings, p r o j e c t appreciated by ordinary people. And、uh, somehow, by making these buildings, I begin to understand how architecture should be made. Maybe for a kind of a humans. I had a quite a interesting experience a few years ago in Madrid. I was visiting one of my friends there, and he took me to、uh, Piazza San Diego, where Opera house faces. And the people are looking at these pictures. And I asked my friend, What's going on? It's、uh, Opera Verdi and、uh, done by,、uh, sung by、uh, Domingo. And I said, Free? But I thought culture should be. Able to disseminate with something freely, not always charging. And to me, similar things happened when I visited the、uh, Planet Nyko Stadium in 1959. This was a picture also I took when I made a Journey to the West, like going to India. And 
amazing thing. It's open and perhaps just like the, uh, this uh, Domingos singing, people are able to see uh, inside without pain. And two or four, that is again Olympic in uh, Athens. And uh, I was able to see exactly the same scenery, but with maybe a little more people. And uh, sometimes when there is uh, games going on, this place will be dotted by the uh, people's clothing and so on. Either one is beautiful. And I think this is one of the best the urban design done in Amy. And it still sits in this way. And I encourage you to look at this one with this. Then it hit. It's a kind of an unconditional love. I understand this word appears in Bible. And I think our cultural act should be based on unconditional love. But there are many <laughs> conditional loves, like uh, by uh, Donald Trump, who divides the uh, country into two, for or uh, against. Fortunately, we are in a profession where we can exercise unconditional love. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Maki, for sharing your words of wisdom and projects with us. Now, may I invite Professor Chen to present a souvenir to Professor Maki to express our appreciation. Now, may I invite Mr. Andrew Kenoshita to represent Mr. James Kenoshita, donor of our Kenoshita Lecture Series, to join for a group photo. Thank you.